Today is the sixth day of the June, July, 85, seven-day retreat. Maybe before coming to the main topic of today's talk, which will be undying, we will say one more thing about effort. I don't remember any topic having so stirred people's minds as this thing of effort, and that there may be a way of working without effort. And to really look at the effort that one was making and the resistance at the same time. One person said something like this, Maybe it is a conglomerate of what several people said. Yes, in this setting here, with its immense quietness, the mind actually slowing down or quieting down at times, at least the surface layers. Not being constantly occupied with the 10,000 things of the daily life, all the demands that come up to one, all of the things that one has organized oneself to do. There is a possibility to see the real true nature of effort, the resistance. And in the seeing for that to drop and just to to be there as one is and to be with everything as it is. without any opposition or conflict. But thinking ahead of when I get back home into my job, where there is a constant jockeying for position in one way or another, a trying to do better to advance or to outdo, which is in the air. The thoughts about that are in the air. One can feel it. This tremendous current of driving, achieving, attaining, pushing, How will one withstand that current once one finds oneself back in the middle of it? I think having asked this question and asking it not casually, but deeply, seriously. Because one sees all the implications of effort, resistance, striving, and the immediate impact it has on relationship with the people around one, the separation and isolation, 
or outright hostility, envy. The envy of competitiveness. Having asked this question, how, how can I or can I possibly withstand this? Is it possible? Will one watch it? The force is the power of the current, how it manifests in the people around one and in oneself. One is not separate of that. And does the insight into this whole thing need a quiet hillside? the broad sky and a creek running down the ravine? Is it tied to a place, to an environment? Or can that happen anytime, any place, where a human being is consumed with a question? which could, one could say is a question of life and death. Either living freely, lovingly, without division and separation, or being locked into this compartment on a train, a train of success, of achieving, attaining, becoming. Which not only separates us, but puts us constantly on a collision course with each other. On a small scale and on a global scale. If one really sees the enormous danger of competing, striving, driving, all one's compulsive habits to do so, one really sees the danger like one sees the danger of poison ivy. Maybe one has had a rash all over for weeks. <coughs> then no matter how lovely the leaves, how delicate the flower and beautiful the berries, one will not make a bouquet out of it. One will leave it alone. And there's no effort in that. It's just seeing it and acting intelligently on the basis of what one sees. Just because we all find ourselves in the current of being somebody and becoming somebody, which is all connected with self-image, does not mean that this current has to continue, even if it has continued since time immemorial. There was no possibility of stepping out, as it were, not being part of this. We all be doomed. Doomed to forever isolation and collision. And the total absence of love.
since the mind is trained, conditioned in thinking and opposites, immediately the thought may come up again, what does it mean then to do nothing? To, to discover immediately when a thought like this comes up, yeah, here again one thinks either I'm striving or else I'm, I'll be drifting. That's an activity of the mind, it is not factual. To see this whole movement of striving, driving, pushing, competing, becoming, as a movement away from what actually is happening this instant, the fullness of it, the wholeness of it, and the depth of it, of this instant. Seeing the one, won't the energies quite naturally gather in just being here? Why jump to a conclusion that the opposite will be going to sleep? That's just idea. Or does one in fact find that if a goal or a mode of living which has become so habitual is pulled out from under one, one does in fact go to sleep. There's nothing else left to do. But there's thought involved. Now I have lost what propelled me. It's a despair, thought of not having what one had and also feeling, feeling of great insecurity and not facing that as what is going on, rather going to sleep, not to have to face the pain of loss or the insecurity of a lost structure. But if the mind doesn't swing into concluding the opposite, drifting directionlessly when one doesn't have a direction, but rather seeing what is here at hand, underfoot, under one's nose, right next to one, right within one, then the energy will be there to, to be with it. It doesn't have to be aroused. It is everywhere. don't waste it on our many pursuits to become somebody or to be somebody and all that's connected with that, the defenses, the hurts, or the wallowing in, in pride. When energies don't flow that way because it's seen as a dead end, and they do gather. And this gathering energy is attention, is awareness. Or, if you don't want to use this word, it is being with what is. that is without any division, not trying to manipulate or overcome, 
or clutch it and cling it and grasp it, then what is changes. It does not remain the same. Anger or fear dissolves because it arises out of division. That's where it has its root, its lifeline is division. When the vision comes to an end, this lifeline withers. Lifeline to anger, fear. Hostility. This is nothing to be be to be believed, but to be seen in oneself, explored and discovered. Is it so or is it not so? One has to find out. talking so much during talks and meetings about self-image. And really seeing self-image operate in oneself. There easily comes the fear of what will I be when I have no image. Sometimes it is not just fear, it is outright terror. At seeing an image of oneself crumble, or a whole bunch of images crumble, as being just that. Then maybe the thought, what's going to happen to me when I have None of that to hold on to. The, the power of attachment is, is there. <coughs> if one looks at that terror, not immediately escape into something else, some mental activity, daydreaming or invoking beliefs, new ones or old ones, which comfort one. When one puts that aside and looks, faces the fear or the terror, allows it to be there, to show itself. One realizes it is this fear of dying, fear of ending, as someone that one has known And as someone one wants to continue. Can one see that as one knows of oneself, it is all a series of images, a continuity, with a continuity which has the continuity of a story, of a novel, or of a movie, a play. It 
the main character being oneself, and the attachment to this character through this whole continuity of the story. And with the attachment, the desire for this story to continue forever after. I remember being an avid reader of fairy tales as a child. <clears throat> reading the same fairy tales over and over till the book was in shreds. And then feeling so good, so taken seriously when my parents had this little storybook rebound with a little gold letter on it. Grimm's Fairy Tales. Both volumes this time in one. It, 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 this was my Bible. So I was told. <laughs> to go through these stories and then that most important last line. Namely, then they lived happily forever after. No matter what fearful things one encountered, eventually one got what one wanted and lived happily forever after. It's probably this, this ability or this action of the brain to produce continuity through memory and then attachment to that continuity which is provided by memory makes it also so attractive to go to movies where one can put oneself into a story identify with the main characters or whoever one identifies with. And if it was a particularly good movie, one welcomes a second version of it. Superman number two and three. Or Star Wars one, two, I don't know how many there are now. Three, maybe, I don't know. For this to continue, something that one can identify with, to go on. It's so comforting, so comforting. There's such pleasure in that. And such escape away from the possibility that there may in fact be no continuity. Of oneself and of the people with whom one identifies or who, who are close to one, on whom one depends, to whom one is attached. And a dread, tremendous fear of this continuity of oneself and whatever one is identified with coming to an end. because one will not face it or allow it to happen. One also invents or takes over the inventions of afterlives, which all religions the world over have done. Paradises or happy hunting grounds Hell is not the nicest prospect to be in, but one can do things in this life to avoid that particular afterlife. If one 
makes arrangements. The whole fascination of the Eastern belief in reincarnation and rebirth, which is taking place now in the West, probably has this fear of ending at its, at its basis. Now the hope of being reborn forever, being reincarnated again, hopefully in a better situation. never really questioning the, the factuality of it or the actuality of it. One believes it and one is asked to believe it. One doesn't know it for oneself. But someone else whom one trusts as being knowledgeable in this, one believes. It may or may not be true. But if one believes, one doesn't question, one doesn't doubt, and one doesn't look at the source of one's beliefs, why one has to have them in the first place, why one clings to them, and gets very upset if they are questioned, or shaken, or abandoned by someone altogether. And there are waves of insecurity rushing through one. Of course, all of us want to live except when one is mentally very ill, doesn't even want to continue living. <coughs> Other than that, all of us want to live and live happily. But why do we want to continue as an image? That's a completely different thing. It's not the same. But we, we mix or confuse these two things. To us living is living as somebody that we have known through memory and continuing to live as that somebody and also imagining becoming more this and more that and less this. Also, a series of images projected into the future. Both past and future being the creation of the mind, of memory and thought, and having nothing to do, to do with this instant of life. Which is there before any image can be formed about it. Once the image has been formed about it, it is already past. It is no longer there. Because image making takes time. Is this, is this a, a vital question for one, why one wants to live and continue as an image, as somebody one can visualize or think about, be proud about, or attached to in one's looks, characteristics, talents, possibilities, potential?
for one thing, it, it is a deeply ingrained habit. We've done it all along. We've been told since we were born what we were. Cute, quick, clumsy, better than the brother, and superior to the sister. All of this came at us. How clever we were, how intelligent we were already speaking at the age of so-and-so, six months. <laughs> Whereas neighbor's child is still not talking. <laughs> it's amazing to me how much we talk about children in the presence of children. Assuming very inattentively, very thoughtlessly that children don't understand. They're just playing. But a child understands very, very early. Maybe not the words, but the looks, the eyes, the expression, the tone. And with that comes this image formation of who one is in the image of the parent or the brother and sister. That, that current that was talked about, this current of thoughts about advancing or being this and wanting to be that and getting ahead, or this current of images is right there. It, it's, one is bathed in it as one is born. And so it's picked up as being me. agreeable and pleasant to my parents or unpleasant and disagreeable to my parents or brothers, sisters. And so there comes the reinforcement of the image or one builds up negative images of oneself, maybe extinguishes some and produces new ones. When or why is there this identification, this identity, that I am this image? It's an illusion. It's not, it's not fact. It's not the truth. And yet this is how one feels. One is convinced about this, or else one wouldn't hurt when the image is offended. Then, one, then I feel hurt. One question that. And just as one questioned really profoundly whether there has to be effort in work and look at it and discover that there may not have to be effort in work, does there have to be an image of oneself? One can question it. Doesn't mean it'll go away or there won't be another one the moment one goes away. But can, can one loosen this tie, this sticky identity that this is me and my life is the life of my images and my future is the survival and continuation of my images. And dying is the end of the image. Actually, that's true. Dying is the end of the image.
but it is not the dying or the ending of this organism. It's not the ending of life in this organism as it is manifested in this organism. So Owen's terror about dying when the image seems to fall apart or is threatened is fear about an image, but one thinks it's fear about one's own life. never lived without an image or has one. Maybe there have been moments, moments which were felt as astonishing, extraordinary freedom and beauty. There was no image of me being there. was the freedom of it being no separate part from this whole flow of life. As it manifests all around one, it is the image and the attachment to it that separates from it. And yet one clings to it. Clinging implying automatically fear of losing, terror of losing, something which is the very essence of separation. Maybe one will say, I'm not just concerned when I'm afraid of death. I'm not just afraid of the ending of the image. I'm afraid of this whole process of dying, of the pain that it may bring, or the circumstances under which it may happen. But this is something none of us know, how we will die, under what circumstances, by what cause, The only thing we know, I think the only thing that's completely certain in this life for anybody is that we will die. The only certainty we have, we dread. All other certainties are illusory to those we claim. Actually, if one walks here through the forests or the woods, the the meadows, one really understands that there is nothing that continues. A bunch of flowers on the side of the road Today one is totally open, tomorrow it's closing, and another one is beginning to open. And some of them are already puffy (coughs) seeds, blowing with a gust of wind. When this road was built here through this forest, 
There was no road, there was no opening in this forest at all. It was just like it is to the left and right of the road. All the trees had to be felled. And the first time we drove on this road, it was a sad sight. It looked like a tornado had struck us, like a disaster area, all these trees gone. The earth broken up. There were still roots sticking out. And there was nothing growing on the banks of the road. What was there had come to an end, to a complete end. Of course, the wood was cut and neatly stacked, and we're now heating the building with that wood. Our warm water comes from it. And some of the wood that is not neatly stacked up is turning into fungus, moss. Moss of a, of a sheen and, and green, many shades of green. That Utterly amazing to see and touch. And then, right now, coming along the road, where did all these daisies come from? Just an ocean of daisies. some red flowers and yellow ones, and some lavender, some tall, some short. They're here because something else ended. One may find in oneself, if one does not give way to terror and fear, but allows it. By giving way, I mean escape from it. I use the wrong words. If one allows it to be there, to, to show itself, to be felt in all its depth, without any escape into any belief, and therefore ending. Ending an image completely. Ending anger or fear completely in this being that completely, in no resistance, no effort to turn it into its opposite courage or peacefulness. Just letting something completely be, completely blossom out and completely in, which it will do. There's no effort to manipulate. meaning no resistance. Maybe only out of such a complete ending that something new can come into being. which has no continuity. Thought has continuity. All of what is continuing is thought in our life, product of thought. 
But life itself, nature, as one observes it, is constantly renewing itself and constantly ending. So is one deeply attached to the story of one's life with its pictures of the past and the future? Can one see that attachment, see that it is to pictures and wonder about it? sees that it is a picture, it can't continue. One is not a picture. One doesn't know what one is. Knowing is narrow and limited and fixed and continuous. But being alive is not. Being alive is not storing up memories, carrying them around, applying them, using them, but dropping them. I don't mean useful memories of how to get to the kitchen to get lunch. We, we don't forget those things. <laughs> how to do a job there. It's helpful to remember how it went wrong last time, how one could improve this whole technological thing of accumulated knowledge, scientific accumulated knowledge is helpful. But to cling to remembered images of oneself and others is the, is, doesn't, prevents relationship, prevents the freedom of starting freshly, meeting each other newly, with an energy that is not loaded down by mental bookkeeping. So is it possible to die as one goes, as it were? Dying to all the things that happen today, seeing them, meeting them, understanding them, and being done with them, so that one can wake up freshly the next morning, or the next moment. I can hear someone say, you're starting to paint an ideal state. Now I want that, but this is not what is talked about. An ideal state to be striven for or applied effort towards. When one is hurt, it is looking at what it is that is getting hurt. I don't mean physically hurt, but psychologically hurt. And seeing whether it is not an image that has gotten hurt, and whether it can drop effortlessly, 
as effortlessly as one will drop poison ivy when one realizes this is what one has picked up. It cannot happen out of willpower or good intentions. We have talked about this lengthily in the past talks. Something withers away when it is seen for what it is without judgment or acceptance or opposition. Then when there is no image and no idea about me, is there fear of dying? Is death itself an image, a thought? And the fear being the fear of not knowing what this is, feel uncomfortable, feeling uncomfortable if one doesn't know, can't know something. Death and dying is not knowing. Not knowing, not being able to bring within the realm of the known. If that causes discomfort, can one allow that discomfort to take its course? Seeing what it arises from, not being able to know something intellectually. Discomfort arises when a habit is disturbed. Habits give us security and rigidity. am I? What am I?
when I have no pictures, when I really don't know. And therefore open to what is actually happening this instant. Open without knowing. We will end here for today.